Santa Fe, and welcome to Shaking Hands at the Roundhouse and Senator Nancy Rodriguez. Nancy, once again, thank you for coming and doing this show for us. Um, we're going to dedicate the show to our old friend, Lucky Varela. Very good. Lucky had been doing this show for, oh, I don't know, 20 years probably. And uh, so you're kind of walked into his shoes a little bit. Yes, you know that uh, Lucky and I served together for many years, um, and I worked very closely with him. We miss him tremendously. Uh, we learned a lot from Lucky, and we're grateful for what he, for the knowledge and the uh, mm -hmm. all the work that he did, because we can pick up on it and continue to move forward with it. Um, you know, a person like Lucky, with his expertise and his passion for work, can not be replaced. It's it's just something that we we have to pick up from and keep going. Um, but that's that's really where we are. It's a big void here at the Capitol without Lucky. Absolutely. He was remarkable in that he knew a little bit about everything that was going on. Yes. <clears throat> he worked for the state for years, and so he was very familiar with, you know, what went on in the state. And a lot of representatives and senators come in completely green on the activities in the state, and it takes them a little while to learn it. So yes. he, he did know it. That's true. And anyone who needed to have some information or uh, either new knowledge or um, just some facts, mm -hmm. strategies, would uh, go to Lucky and we'd all come back very well educated. Well, that's good. Well, it's nice having you today. Nancy, I need to ask you a few questions. I know you're busy, but uh, let's hit a little bit on... Um, on the budget, I know that's the area that's your, your expertise. Uh, the budget started off, how, how are, how's it going with the governor on the budget? Are you coming together? Um, I think we're coming together. Um, you know, the, the process is really the same every year. Uh, this, of course, is a 30-day session, and it's all for an appropriations mm -hmm. uh, discussions. But um, we serve, I serve in the Finance Committee, Standing Committee, and I've served in this committee for 22 years now. And uh, we started early. We start a week before the session starts to start looking at the budget and start looking at uh, different departments mm -hmm. and their budgets and their requests and so on. Uh, so we are moving along fairly quickly. Uh, I think it's going to be good. I think we'll be able to come up with a consensus. And, um, you know, it all takes negotiations. But at the end, we get there. And uh, yesterday, um, we got some better news uh, in the Finance Committee by our forecasters and our economists that the uh, state budget and the revenues are going to be better than what we thought. We were projecting approximately $200 million right. of new money. And, um, you know, we thought, well, with those $200 million, we'll be able to go back and backfill those areas that were cut so drastically in the last two years because there was no funding. The, um, with the uh, crash on the uh, oil prices and everything else, our, our budget took a hit. So the $200 million was barely going to keep us from having to cut any more, and we were going to balance out all right. But yesterday we got some good news, Carlene. We, we um, actually got the information that approximately $93 million new dollars will be coming in for the new fiscal year, which is July 1st, ongoing for a year after that. And if that holds, then um, we should be okay. Mm -hmm. Now for this current year, we were not sure ending June 30th where the budget was going to land up on, what numbers, and you know, we, we, it's been so volatile that we just didn't know what to expect. But we are going to end up this fiscal year with approximately $188 million. Good. And um, that can hopefully go, quite a bit of it, if not all, should go into the reserves because our bond rating was downgraded since we didn't have any reserves at all in the budget. We ended up really bad last year. And so hopefully we can restore some of that. And uh, we are going to really think about focusing more on like public safety, education, health, um, the, um, you know, just those needed programs that are so drastically needed, needed uh, uh, not only because they provide such great service 
to our constituents and the public, but because they, they are so drastically uh, um, short of funding. So um, that's, that's where we are. I sponsored legislation um, you know, for, the, for domestic violence to try and curtail domestic violence because you know as, as the uh, crime goes up, domestic violence goes up, the finances for people, um, if, if people have financial problems, families and so on, it all tends to, uh, to lead ultimately to domestic violence and so on. So it's, uh, it's something that we have to kind of look at all angles to, to make sure that we capture all the problems and how we can approach them effectively. Because if we are just um, single focused on one thing, uh, we end up missing a few other points that are very crucial. Okay, so now uh, teachers will get an increase. I'm sorry, I didn't. Teachers hear. will get an increase. Yes, thank you State for employees. asking that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are proposing an increase. The uh, legislature, the LFC, Legislative Finance Committee, uh, proposed an increase of 1.5 across the board for all state employees. Is that and all state employees or most? All state employees. Oh, Everyone okay. gets 1.5 percent if it's approved. That's the proposal. However, teachers would on an average get approximately 2.7 percent because um, the LFC has recommended that the um, starting salary for teachers go up for all three levels um, licensure levels go up by 2000 so teachers would be at a starting salary of $36,000. It used to be thirty two, dollars and then we moved it up to $34,000. Now it would be thirty six. dollars It's still very low. When you think about it, Carlene, $36,000 of gross pay is really meager. It is. Uh, by the time you come up with your net pay, you can barely make ends meet, especially if you have a family. That's so, right. Yeah. Now if you're an exemplary teacher. There could be another automatic raise for somebody that has done well in their performance. Uh, well, uh, that's called merit pay and that's now in discussion <coughs> between the two chambers and um, the governor's um, budget, the DFA, Department of Finance Administration budget, which is the executive budget, uh, calls for approximately between 11 and 13 million dollars in um, awards for teachers that perform uh, what they call in excellent uh, uh, circumstances, or perform excellently I should say in, in circumstances um, of different areas, for example, math, science, reading, and so on. Um, you know, there, there is approximately, uh, I'd say, five million dollars proposed for the merit pay straight across if they are performing excellently and then more um, proposed for those that perform above and beyond in those topics that I mentioned. So all that still is being discussed right now and negotiated. Merit pay is something that's been very controversial I know it has. because of the fact that you know <clears throat> we don't quite understand and know how uh, the teachers that are given the bonuses or the merit pay are, are selected because of the evaluation system that uh, we don't all agree is, um, is the evaluation system that, that should be you know, in the books for teachers. It doesn't seem fair for teachers. And so it's all those things that we need to discuss before merit pay is approved. Uh, we support teachers, all teachers, uh, but we also support the, that um, we need to have a very fair and, and excellent evaluation system that's fair for all. Okay, now you attended the Women's March, which was held, I believe, the January 21st. Yes, I did. You did attend that. Yes. Was there a big crowd? It was pretty big. I mm -hmm. was impressed. It was a it was a cold day. There was snow on the ground, and um, I remember wearing my winter boots. I hadn't put them on in all winter, and um, I wore them that day. And um, it, it was wonderful. There was quite a bit of energy. It showed the not only the unity that we share, and and um, and how we can express our concerns in in numbers and in in one one um, group, but also it, it just showed the great concerns that are that are clearly setting in. 
as time goes by with the situation in Washington, D.C. and mm -hmm. how much discord there is out there um, uh, with, um, you know, now with President Trump and, and um, the Republicans proposing uh, just different, uh, different um, cuts to very essential programs and so on, uh, we have to unite. We have to unite and keep going together to, uh, to just show um, solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the march was very good. It showed a, a tremendous amount of support for the values and the issues that we support. Now, um, I understand that they did have a class for all the legislators to go to uh, concerning sexual harassment. Um, how did that go? Yes, it went very well. Um, it was well attended, and I think most legislators attended it, and those that couldn't be here that day um, were to um, listen to it, uh, you know, either by phone mm -hmm. or training um, through um, computer or however they, they could, but they taped it, and, uh, and uh, everyone that I know of has been uh, already in compliance for the attendance. Um, I, I thought it was very good. Uh, it brought to light a lot of the um, issues that I think uh, over the years have been very sensitive issues and uh, we had an attorney come in and uh, explain the situation and uh, and he was very clear on it. I, I think it's pretty good. I, I, you know, it was long overdue. It's been quite a few years since we've even looked at the harassment policy mm -hmm. here at the state capitol and uh, it was very vague in the past, uh, and now this new one that we have approved is uh, is quite comprehensive, and um, it's uh, certainly not ambiguous at all. So we're happy about that. Well, that's good. I'm glad glad you had a good turnout for that. Uh, going back to the CYFD, this is kind of one of my my things. I, I, you know, there is so much domestic abuse in this state. Child abuse is horrible. We yes. have a case in Albuquerque right now. They killed that little girl. Um, how do you stop this? I know you're going to put in more laws, more rules, but how do you keep people off of drugs and, and violent situations that they're in? Yes. Um, women, single women with children that can't afford them. Yes, you know that the, the crime rates have increased tremendously mm -hmm. in New Mexico. We just had a report from the uh, Public Safety, Department of Public Safety, about how, um, how the crime, and also the district attorneys um, in New Mexico presented how the crime in New Mexico has increased. We are now number one in the nation for murder. Yes. That is very bad. We are number two, second in, New in the nation in New Mexico for property crimes break-ins and you know into your car your home however it may be um, I just never thought that we would get to the day when New Mexico was uh, was uh, you know that bad as far as the uh, the ratings um, but it's very clear that uh, it's it's continuing to get worse and worse now I um, I have two pieces of legislation at least but two of them are for CYFD uh, that uh, would hopefully get some funding to, um, to assist with the children uh, who are uh, traumatized from domestic violence, domestic abuse, from uh, being around environments where their parents are on drugs um, or whatever form of abuse they would have that hopefully we can curtail and, and my goal is to stop it all if we can in New Mexico. Uh, we know it can't be done overnight, but it's been too long since it's happening, and we need to truly uh, try and do something about that. Uh, another bill that I have, and I sponsor this quite often, uh, is to provide funding for domestic violence victims and their animals, because what happens many times, Carlene, is that uh, families who are being abused do not run to shelters to get help, even though the shelter is there and available. The reason for that is because they have pets. Some of them are therapy animals. Some of them are assistance animals. 
and some of them are pets. And, I mean, pets, just ordinary pets that provide, uh, you know, that, that therapy just by companionship and so on. And 70%, uh, which is astonishing to me, 70% of families do not run for help because they don't know what to do with their animals and they know that if their animals are left behind, they are going to get abused. Right. And so, and of course, they can lose the animal altogether because, and the pet, because they are, I mean, it's an abusive situation. So my bill provides funding not only for the domestic violence victims of families, but for their animals so that they can have a place to run with their animals and not have to worry about it. When you're in a domestic abuse situation, you shouldn't have to stand there and wonder, where do I go? How do I leave my pet? Where do I leave my pet? Who's going to take care of it? Is it going to be fed? Um, is it going to freeze in the winter? Where are they going to put it? There should be a place all the time readily available, a shelter for pets also. And it is amazing how organizations have come together under what's called a care program to assist in this area. Now families can go and get services and get protection in a shelter and take their animals where they have to go. So I'm hoping to get more funding. I sponsored the first appropriation for that a few years ago and we made it stick as recurring money so that they can continue to get the money every year, you know, the, the uh, funding. And this year I'm hoping to continue to augment that amount. Um, you, you know, it's a holistic situation when you think about it. If we don't approach this whole thing with domestic violence and abuse and drug addiction and um, you name it, if we do not approach it um, in a wholesome manner, where we get all and capture all facets of it, we will not make a difference. Um, and so I think that's something that we are really learning, that it all goes together as one piece. Okay. So, yes. Nancy, Santa Fe, uh, this is a senator that is protecting not only children, but the whole family and the pets. Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlene. Santa Fe, we're back to uh, shaking hands at the Roundhouse with Senator Liz Stefanics. Thank you so much for coming in here for this interview. Well, thank you for inviting me in. Last time I saw you, you were a county commissioner. Yes, um, I did eight years as a county commissioner, and then when this seat uh, was open for election, I chose to run for it. This is the seat that Senator Phil Griego right. loved. And then the governor appointed a uh, Republican into a Democratic seat. And I thought, well, I just need to run for that seat. Well, good for you. <laughs> it's the day of the women. Well, I not exactly. The, the, Senate, <laughs> the Senate has lost women over have time. Have they really? Yes, they have. When I was in the Senate uh, 25 years ago, we had as many as 11 women mm -hmm. in the Senate. We're down to uh, six or seven right now. Well, I understand there are going to be more women running for public office in this country than ever before. Great. So, see, you might get some. We need them. <laughs> okay. Senator, uh, you represent District 39. Yes. That's a, that's a big district. It's huge. It's um, parts of six counties. It, if you started up north in Las Vegas, New Mexico, which is in San Miguel County. Mm -hmm. uh, you would travel all the way down to uh, Rio Doso in Lincoln County. If I travel from one end to the other, it might take about five hours. Uh, the population is very diverse and most of the area, not all, but most of the area that I represent is rural or small town. Mm -hmm. it's, that's a, it's an unusual group of people. It's very diversified, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's great. Okay, one of the things you've been working on, senior nutrition. Yes, Tell I'm me really a little bit about that. I'm very concerned about senior nutrition. Um, right now, I have a bill and a memorial, and the bill would put five hundred thousand dollars into the aging and long-term services department 
to distribute to senior centers, mm -hmm. to use for congregate meals or home delivered meals, for purchase of produce from New Mexico farmers. It's much like the bill that is for schools, public schools, that, but uh, my bill is much less money. The other bill is uh, about a million and a half for the public schools to continue being able to buy fresh produce from the New Mexico farmers to distribute and have in public schools. My issue with this is that I have been in this six county district, I go to the senior centers a lot to visit. Mm -hmm. So I'm very aware and I'm a senior citizen now, so I'm very aware of what they're eating for lunch, and it is rare that they have any fresh fruits or vegetables on their plate. The other thing that has happened is when I've been to some senior uh, programs, uh, they have been cut back in staff, and uh, I had one senior center close in one county, I had a letter from uh, the city and the county in, an, in another area that said we're planning on closing a senior center mm -hmm. because we're not getting enough money from the state. And so right now what's happening, I have this bill for money for food, but I also have a memorial that would look at the federal and the state cuts to funding for senior centers to have a report back to the Interim Health and Human Services <coughs> Committee so that we have it in really black and white. I've tried to bring this up several times over the interim, and we've had so many issues that we've been addressing at the Health and Human Services Interim Committee. I'm a member of that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not in leadership on that, but I'm a member. And I would like to bring this to the attention of the entire legislature that things are kind of, well, not kind of, they are being eroded when it comes time for senior services. Now you're talking statewide. Statewide. Well, you know, we have a great program. We have several programs here in Santa Fe, and uh, of course, Kitchen Angels. I volunteered there for several years, and uh, I used to wash the dishes. <laughs> right, but see, this is totally different. Senior programs are funded by state, federal money, and cities and counties are asked to pitch in. And that is where your senior citizens, regardless of money, go to socialize and have meals or have meals delivered. And Kitchen Angels is one of my favorite charities, but yeah. it's totally different. Totally different. Totally different. Um, you know, Kitchen Angels, you might think about, if you're thinking about quality of restaurant food, mm -hmm. that's not what you get in a senior center. And those people are very happy to eat anything. When I um, was at one senior citizen center visiting, I sat with a woman who had been transferred here from another um, state because she needed specific medical care from our VA hospital. She lives in uh, subsidized housing and uh, she had, you could tell she had very little money. Her clothes were not clean. She had an assistance dog and she ate her lunch and then she went back and got in line and said, is there any more food? And I talked to her later and that was her one meal of the day. Wow. The one meal of the day. Now, others, uh, I was sitting at home one day and I got a call from a senior center in another county and a woman said, you know, I paid my $2 to have lunch and I and the 10 people behind me had no food left. When we got up to be served, there was no food left. Now, that's not what should be happening to our seniors in this state. That's for sure. Yeah, shouldn't happen in this country. No, it shouldn't. The senior centers are a federal, state, city, and county obligation, and that's why I'm focusing on it. How much support are you getting from the legislators? legislators? Well, the bill is just starting to be heard. Mm -hmm. The uh, bill for the financing is up this afternoon in Senate Public Affairs. We may or may not have a hearing because the chair is gone today. Uh, so we're actually on the floor discussing whether or not that committee is going to be meeting. And the memorials here take a much longer period of time because they have to go through Senate rules and then they go on to um, a committee like public affairs, then they come to the floor, then it goes over to the other house mm -hmm. to discuss. Senate rules first deals with confirmations that are sent down from the governor's office. The governor actually appoints close to 3,000 people 
to boards and commissions during a term. And they all have to go through Senate Rules Committee to be confirmed. Wow. So oftentimes, the business of the legislature that needs to go through Senate rules doesn't get through because they're working on confirmations. Mm, seems like a waste of time, doesn't it? It's a process. It's hard to get a bill through when you have to go through It's that a much. memorial. The memorials go through Senate rules. Mm -hmm. And there might be a speedier way, but in an age of democracy, Everybody wants to be able to say, yes, this is a good idea, or no, okay. we don't like that idea. And so when it comes time for me to present to Senate rules, I doubt that people will be sitting there saying, we don't care about our senior citizens. Okay. But it needs to go through the process. There have been times when I've been in Senate rules and people didn't like a memorial that I had. They might have felt that it excluded a group. Usually a memorial is uh, creating a task force to study something or ha asking an entity to come and do a report. I have one memorial this year that has to do with Highway 14 and the fatal accidents that have been happening in Madrid or Madrid right on Highway 14. There are some curves and when the trucks come down from the, the mountain and they don't uh, heed the, the uh, speeding signs, and they're going too fast around the curves. There's been several that have gone over and almost right. hit some propane tanks, but the drivers have died. They've been fatal accidents. It's a very dangerous highway down right. there. Right, but see, Highway 14, that memorial might not appeal to people from other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. They might go, well, I have some dangerous roads in my area. Why do we need this memorial? Yeah. So it gives everyone on the committee an opportunity to weigh in. I see. I see. Okay, I understand you're also working on a solar program. Right. Senator Mimi Stewart has for a few years um, been, been reintroducing our tax credit, our state tax credit, but with it comes money. You have to fund the state tax credit so that people can apply. We still have a federal tax credit available, and I myself have availed myself of the state tax credit and the federal tax credit several years ago. We have a um, solar situation with um, uh, 24 panels because I live in the country. Mm -hmm. And what happened is based upon the federal tax credit and the state one, we were allowed to apply for about a 40% rebate on our uh, solar project at our home. Now solar projects can be very expensive, but what's happened is over the years, we have some economies now so that solar panels are not that expensive. And even HomeWise here in Santa Fe in their affordable housing projects are putting solar on those affordable yes, houses. They are. So I am assisting Senator Mimi Stewart with her bill and trying to get this tax state tax credit back to match the federal one. But it requires uh, a few million dollars. What happens is that money will be probably used up by people applying by maybe September or October. It won't even last the entire year. I'll be darned. Right, because it's a very popular program. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about this adult education program. Well, I and uh, some other legislators went to a workshop sponsored by the National Conference of State Legislators on economic opportunities for families. We have a high poverty rate in our state. We have many people who are not employed. And the question is, are those people not employed because they don't have any education or an educational certificate or diploma to take with them when they go to apply? Do they have the study skills? Do they have the language skills? Do they have the math skills? So one of the things that we learned um, from, we had several national um, think tanks come in, foundations, both Democrat and Republican, liberal, conservative, middle of the road. But the research all focuses on getting a high school diploma, not a GED, a high school diploma 
moving people further ahead in jobs, that employers would rather see that piece of paper that says diploma. And they don't look at the year. So they don't care if you got that diploma last year and you're not mm -hmm. you know, young. They just care that you have a diploma. GED in some people's minds spells out, they didn't really go to school. They didn't really study. They don't have those study skills to learn what's going to be needed on the job. So I and some of the, my colleagues who went, and they were representative um, Debbie Armstrong, Stephanie Garcia Richards, Liz Thompson, and I, I was the only one from the Senate who uh, attended this workshop. We have worked on a plan that we would like to roll out over a series of years. And this is the initial step of a plan is to try to beef up some adult education. So when I introduced this bill, the um, higher education department called me and said, what is this all about? And so when I told them, because it's very general appropriation, they were very excited. They said, this is great. And the reason they thought it was great is because number one, any state money we put in is gonna be matched by federal money. And uh, about, I put in a request for $500,000 and that 500,000 matched with the federal money will allow another 1,200 students, adults, to come into adult basic education for the skills and the training that they need. So they're, they're, they're getting some training. You know, I was reading the other day on a program they have going on in Germany, Angela Merkel mm -hmm. has it, where, where she's bringing uneducated people into programs where they can learn how to, especially the computer computer generation. And she's having great success with this. She's educating people that are older that maybe didn't get the education as a, you know, when they were younger. And it would be great for this whole country. Well, this is similar to another program that we have uh, where employers come in and they say, we need X number of people to uh, be able to do this job. And if you don't have the trained people, we'll put up a little money to match the state money to educate those people with the skills we need. It might be computers, it might be welding, yeah, it might be construction. Yeah, yeah, so my hope is that we'll do it little step by little step on working on poverty and trying to get people out of poverty. How do you work, like for instance, here in Santa Fe, we have Santa Fe Community College. Yes. How do you work? directly with them? Would this program involve any of these uh, community colleges? Well, actually, we have some rules on the books uh, that don't really allow the colleges to get involved in high school diplomas. Okay. So what we have to do is, I have to work with the superintendent of public schools and the San Aunt Santa Fe Community College and see if they will collaborate on a project together. Okay. Now, the Santa Fe Community College has this beautiful higher education building Absolutely. Caddy Corner from Santa Fe High. Mm -hmm. And if the public schools and the community college would collaborate, that high school diploma classes, online, in person, work experience, life experience, however we're going to create uh, and work on that diploma, could be done right there in that building. Great idea. Okay. Thank you Senator, so much. Thank you. You're yes. out to educate and feed the population. I in am, New and I, I hope some of these will be successful during this session. But thank you for your good work. Yeah, thank you for showing up. Okay. Santa Fe on Shaking Hands today at the Capitol. We have Senator Howie Morales from Silver City. Thank you for having me here with you today. And you've aged. I have. Well. Been here, been here nearly 11 sessions. Already. I know. I remember meeting you when you were just a kid. Yeah, I still feel like a kid, so that's a good thing. That's good. <laughs> Through Kiki, Kiki Saavedra. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful person I got to learn from. A lot of the finance issues that we deal with now, uh, he was definitely instrumental in helping me learn the ropes. That's right. And you took uh, Altamirano's place. I did. After the unfortunate passing of Senator Ben Altamirano in 2007, I was appointed to fill his, his seat. Um, 
such a such a wonderful legacy that he left and and continue to work towards all the things that he stood for yeah I understand I can congratulate you you got some kind of an award for baseball I, I coach did. of the year coach yeah. of what what's that all about education is at the heart of what I've done mm -hmm. and during that time I was able to be a coach and to work with young kids at the high school level and to help build up the, the team work, the, just all aspects of, of character. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of success there in Silver City and at Cobre High School uh, down in Grant County. And because of the kids we and the volunteers and, and assistant coaches, we, we did some special things there. So the Coaches Hall of Fame, uh, I was inducted into Coaches Hall of Fame in December. And with a complete surprise, my Senate colleagues uh, did a memorial to, to recognize that. What a nice gesture. It was. And congratulations yeah. on that. No wonder you look so young. You're working with kids. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and having a having a nine-year-old and a six-year-old, I haven't stopped coaching. Yeah. I don't coach at the high school level, but I'm there at the little league level and, uh, and love every moment of it. That's good. That's great. What do you do in Silver City? I, education, again, is, mm -hmm. is the heart of what I do. I've uh, worked in healthcare for nine years. I had the opportunity to look at patient satisfaction, quality, um, uh, professional development, and so I enjoyed those moments then um, and continue to do that kind of line of work and recruiting as much as we can to bring professionals into New Mexico and to grow our own within the state to help with the healthcare field. Very good. Uh, I've been reading a lot about this Nurses Compact. Uh, you you carried that bill? I or? did. I, I was a co-sponsor on that with Senator Kernan from Hobbs and Senator Engel from Portellis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, fortunately with my background in health care and the work that I've done with nurses at the local level and all across the state, this was an absolutely vital piece of legislation we needed to pass. Without it, our health care system could have fallen to its knees. What was the purpose? Uh, was that other nurses coming in from other states or? Dual purpose. One of those purposes was to make sure that those that come in to help us fill a void in an extreme shortage area um, to come in and to practice through a compact uh, license system that's, that was in I place see. for 25 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. It had been updated. New Mexico hadn't updated their, their compact agreement then. But it also serves for New Mexico nurses who also travel uh, to other states to, to provide services as well. They wouldn't have been able to do so and had to have gone and got relicensed in every state. We, we through much discussion, much debate, um, we got it through both chambers. The governor signed it and was the first bill of this legislative session to be signed. Yes, that's what I heard. Did, did she sign that right away with no, no complaints or anything? Uh, well, I think when you go through the legislative process, you're mm -hmm. going to have times that you you have disagreements, that you're going to want things a certain way, but it took all of us from both sides of the chambers, from both houses, to make sure that we can get this up there and sign it because we had a deadline by Friday of last week yeah. to have gotten this signed, and we did that. Congratulations on that, too. Thank you. What about the tobacco? You know, it's an effort that I have as I bring forward opportunities for education. We see all the time that programs are being cut. We see that our employees, our educators, uh, uh, educational assistance, all of those individuals have not received a substantial raise in years. It's because there's not very much money that's been going to education system. This is an opportunity to do two things. One is it gives the opportunity to help for a healthier New Mexico, where majority of the public supports if there has to be a tax, if this is the one that they support. Um, but it also brings in dollars into the classroom, $89 million that would come to our school systems in a much needed time. Uh, probably more so now, more than ever. Now, that tax actually came in quite a few years ago, didn't it? Wasn't there a tobacco tax? I think it was in Gary Johnson's administration. Uh, there was some type of a tax that came up, and a lot of people squabbled that smoked, smoked over here, but it went through. There, there was, and in 2010 was there the last one that, uh, that there was a, a, an additional tax added mm -hmm. there. Um, but what was interesting is that it did, I believe, help some people uh, quit smoking, and that's the goal from yeah. that. But the revenue that came in wasn't any lower because an argument that's been made, well, if you're going to um, increase the tax, less people are going to smoke, so less money is going to be coming in. Um, even at that, I think that the data has shown that the revenue stream has stayed pretty, pretty um, uh, similar. 
before that tax. So mm -hmm. I, I feel confident that it's much needed dollars with our school system and I'm glad to be and proud to be a sponsor of that piece of legislation. Okay, what's the Gila River? You know, this is an important issue in dealing with the state of New Mexico and our last free-flowing river. Uh, it's in my backyard down mm, in Grant County. It's beautiful. But, um, but there's a lot of discussion. Is that is it the best use of our taxpayer dollars when the projected cost of that could be up to a billion-dollar project and you're going to get $60 million that you can have from the federal government coming in? Um, it doesn't add up if we divert the Gila River. So my proposal is to fund projects in southwest New Mexico where the Arizona Water Settlement, settlement um, stipulates that we, we fund uh, those projects. Use those projects for, for shovel-ready um, opportunities that can put people to work, that can uh, help with conservation, and then avoid the billion-dollar project of diverting the Gila River. So it's a big issue among the environmental groups mm -hmm. across the state, and it's a big issue for me because I want to make sure that our river is free-flowing. It's a beautiful river. It, it is. It is. And, and I think that it would be a mistake in the wrong side of history if we went and, and, and diverted that. Do you fly fish? I don't fly fish. I, you know, I'm very lucky to catch a fish <laughs> you know, once in a while. And even more lucky if I have time to get out there. But with my kids, we, we do try to make it a, a point to get out there a couple times over the summer. That's wonderful, fly fishing down there. Yeah. You better yeah. take it up. I, I'll have to learn to do that. <laughs> Okay, protection for seniors. This is a big issue. When we look and see the population across the state of New Mexico and see the impact that's taken place with all services, it's the responsibility of us as a legislature and myself to make sure that we can protect all seniors. Just recently, the Aging Long-Term Services Department canceled out the contract with the, with the um, group that was responsible for putting uh, services out there for all of our seniors mm -hmm. uh, across the state. 65 providers were sent notice that the department will now handle all the, the business in dealing with our senior services. This is a real concern to me because these seniors depend on these, on these services, um, meals on wheels, transportation to their uh, uh, medical appointments, congregate meals at the senior uh, service uh, centers. These are things that we have to do as a state to make sure we're protecting the most vital populations of our state and the seniors being one of that. So I'm very concerned that the department has gone a direction that they don't have the capacity to fulfill their obligation. I think that they're going to take that out for, for bid come six months down the road. And I'm not sure whoever would be contracted to do those would have the best interests in mind of our seniors. So I'm going to advocate, stand up, and make sure that our seniors have a voice here in the legislature. Now, are you talking statewide? Uh, state 32 out of 33 counties will okay. be affected by this change. How many senior uh, areas are there, senior groups? There's 65 providers that meet all the needs across the state of New Mexico other than Bernalillo County. So when you have those 65 providers that, that are providing services in all 32 counties, um, aside from Bernalillo County, yeah, that's a, that's a concern because these are a huge number of individuals who depend on these services mm -hmm. to be there for them. What's your background? Uh, where did you go to school? I, yeah, I graduated from Silver High School. Mm -hmm. um, went and got my bachelor's in education from Western New Mexico. Went on to my, get my master's there as well in bilingual special education. Um, I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to position myself to be a voice and advocate for education. And so I went on and got a PhD from New Mexico State. So mm -hmm. proud of my background, proud of the, the opportunities that our school systems provided me. And I think it's been very instrumental in the work they've done here at the legislature. What's the, do they have any mining at all going on down there anymore uh, with the copper? You know, there was such a row years ago over that and a lot of people really gotten used and abused, I guess. The, the mining industry seems to be doing well right now. It is. And the, it, which means that the economy of uh, the district that I serve is, is doing fairly well as well. But, um, you know, at the same time, the, the, the extraction industries are, are something that the state has depended on for many years. And I think that we also have to keep in mind that finding other opportunities to have a general revenue stream within our state. So we've got to find other options. And we've mm -hmm. got to make sure we're not just reliant on the extraction industry. But it, it is doing okay there. Now, what's hurting our local governments all across the state is when a, a tax break was given to corporations, the shift of burden was put on local governments. 
So we've had to raise taxes all across the state. Even though the governor will say that she's not raised taxes, the reality of it, that right. tax break was forced taxes that were raised at the local level. Yeah. What other committees do you serve on here? Uh, in the legislature, when you serve on Senate Finance, that's the only committee that you serve that's on. And so during the session, I'm dealing with the budget and, and working with my colleagues. We put an additional $27 million in early childhood education this session, an additional $35 million to help with Medicaid match, which brings us about 140 in after we get a match. Um, and I think it's an instrumental uh, part of what I do, but it's the only uh, committee I serve on because we meet every day. In the interim, I'm, I'm busy. I serve on education committees, I serve on health committees, on the legislative finance committee. So a broad range of, of issues that are important to New Mexico. Fortunately, I'm in a position to have a voice on that. Yeah. Uh, on this Medicaid, what do you see in the future for New Mexico? I know it's a real touchy subject right now. We could lose it. Absolutely. And our, our, our senior population, people across the state that really depend on that, um, children, the services that are there, really concerned that there's changes that have been talked about at federal level yeah. that would impact us here. New Mexicans would suffer probably more so than any other state in the country. And so we've got to make sure that we can do all we can to hold our end to provide these services for the people who need it the most. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, we have one of the poorest populations in the country and really mm -hmm. can't afford to lose that. We really can't, and I think that if there's something that has been done well during this term uh, of the governor is that there was expansion of Medicaid was signed in, which assisted us because had that not been in place, we would have absolutely no job growth because the healthcare industry gave us the opportunity to, to have some job growth uh, within the state. Okay. Senator Morales, it's good to see you Very again. Very nice to see you. And thank, thank you. you for being on our show. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it and okay. love to visit with you some more. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Santa Fe. We're back at Shaking Hands at the Roundhouse with Senator Peter Wirth, who is now the big man up here, majority floor leader. What's that like? Well, it's a new role, that's for sure. You and I have done these interviews many times over yes. the years, and I had been a committee chair of Senate Conservation for four years, and really enjoyed doing that, mm -hmm. but we had changes as a result of the election in 2016, and our former Majority Floor Leader Michael Sanchez uh, was defeated, but we picked up some seats in the Senate, the Democrats did, and one of the things that happened was that uh, a number of my colleagues came and asked me to run to be the Majority Floor Leader, mm -hmm. and I was incredibly honored to be elected by acclamation, which means that the whole caucus supported me doing this. And so it's been a big learning curve. That's quite a compliment. So it's a good thing. It's yeah. a good thing. So you, You're kind of one of these people that believes in a little working with, together with people. I do. There's no question that, uh, you know, these days in our political system, especially what we see in Washington, this dysfunction and inability to, to have conversations across mm -hmm. the aisle, let alone work across the aisle. One of the things about the state Senate that's, that's amazing is that Democrats and Republicans don't just talk to each other, we actually work together. Yeah. And this last year, you know, the, my first session in 2017 when we were in fiscal crisis, it was incredibly empowering to see this chamber in a bipartisan manner fashion bills that the governor didn't like. But it wasn't just the Democrats supporting those bills, it was bipartisan with most of the Republicans Absolutely. supporting as well. Absolutely, yeah, it was. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Do you think we, we have an outdated legislature? It's a good question, and it's one that I think we need to continue to discuss how to address. So remember, we're here, we being all 
112 citizen legislators. I'm a lawyer. I shut down my law practice and come up here to basically volunteer. Uh, we get a per diem, which is a $160 to $180. It varies per day. Uh, I'm lucky. I, I'm not going to complain because I'm very you lucky. Live I live here. I live here, and it's an incredible honor to do this. But I do think in these 30 days, we are building a $6.3 billion budget and dealing with all of these different issues. And I just think that at some point, the voters are going to need to be given the chance to consider changes. It will require a constitutional change to add uh, some more months to this, to have some part-time salaries for legislators, and that would be up to the voters to see uh, if that's something they want to approve. I'll, I will tell you, there's a lot of people who feel that the less time we're here, the safer they are. <laughs> So I'm going to be honest, I don't know whether that would even pass, but, well, but boy, these structural changes need to be you, worked through. You've got a 30-day session, then you have a 60-day six, session. Uh, you can't get much done in that, that time. It's pretty hard. It's hard. I mean, and the thing, the thing your listeners need to understand is that passing a bill is tough to begin with. I mean, you've got to go through committees in one chamber, then the floor committees in the other chamber, then the floor, then you've got to line up both versions from the two houses, then it goes up to the governor who can sign it or veto the whole thing. And so it, it's a real journey to pass legislation, especially things that are controversial. That's right. Well, uh, we just had Senator Stefanik's in here and she got into that, with, you know, how much she has to go through to get something passed. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say this, uh, in 2016, which was a 30-day session. Uh, I was part of a, an effort led by the courts to change the Constitution with respect to bail. And I think of the 14 years I've been here, that is the most significant piece of legislation. It was a, a joint resolution that didn't go to the governor, but we passed it in both chambers, went to the voters, and the voters approved that uh, in November 2016. So that, to me, proved, even in a 30-day session with something that was as controversial as that was, we were able to get it through with Republicans and Democrats supporting and Republicans and Democrats opposing. Yeah. So it was one of those bills that got us into that, that interesting zone where you're compromising and figuring things out. So it can happen. Yeah, in the last 22 years, I read this the other day somewhere, one of my books that I was reading, uh, We've had to have 20 special sessions. Well, and certainly just in the recent period, the last two years, yes. we've been in complete crisis mode. And so we can't run deficit budgets in, in, our, in our state by the Constitution. So we've had to come into special session just to make the books balance. And again, when you have you know, different political agendas that a governor wants to push. Uh, I've been around long enough that Governor Richardson used to call special sessions to deal with non-budget related items. Mm -hmm. So it is something that, uh, again, looking at the whole picture, I do think that, that we need to continue to figure out ways to make the process better. Okay, another thing. You're, you were, have been involved with the conservation. Correct. Okay. This last year, there's been a big row here in New Mexico over Chaco Canyon, uh, the Del Nor uh, Rio Grande del Norte, mm -hmm. uh, Oregon Mountains, <clears throat> cutting into these treasures that we have here in New Mexico and extracting oil, gas, yada, yada, yada. It's not right. Well, I agree with you. And so we've had a whole string of bills to also transfer public lands, federal public lands, to the state, which opens them up to all kinds of different things. And I've always been adamantly opposed to those. Uh, at the state level, uh, even during that two-year window when the Democrats controlled the Senate but the Republicans controlled the House, we were able in the Senate Conservation Committee to stop all of those bills to transfer public lands. And so that was an important, they were close votes though, let me tell you. It wasn't an automatic thing. Um, we had a committee room full of tribal members. 
who are very concerned when you start taking federal protections away from from tribal lands and obviously tribal public lands. Uh, but we stopped those and, and again I think it's now we have obviously a federal effort to start rolling back all the federal protections and I'm thankful that our congressional delegation was able to slow that down here with respect to the New Mexico monuments but what happened in Utah oh, with Bears Ear was, Bear was yeah. horrible. So, so we just have to be very, very vigilant. And I think I still sit on the Conservation Committee, and I'm, I think now uh, there's no question the majority of the members of that committee feel the same way. Well, you know, I think it was 1904, Teddy Roosevelt came up with this protected, protection. Every Democrat, every Republican has backed that up until now. Well, and it's, it is, it is a, it's an interesting question as to why the Republican Party has lost that conservation kind of argument and somehow this is just rape and pillage and be short-sighted and not think about long-term consequences about climate change. Uh, so that, it's, it's, it's frustrating because again, the conservative approach is to protect these lands for future generations and yet <clears throat> it has become a political thing and that's really too bad. It is. It's sad. We've got uh, uh, petroglyphs, we've got beautiful country in this state. Uh, I don't want to see it go. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see it in the hands of somebody that's not going to take care of it. Yeah. I don't think anybody does. Uh, I completely agree with you. Okay. Tell me what you what you've been working on in this year's legislation. Well, so here, this is, this is kind of fun. This is the first time in 14 years that I have not carried any bills. <laughs> so that, and it's, and it's, and I, and let, but let me say this, I, it doesn't mean I'm not working every minute over here because one of the things when you're in the leadership, it just requires management of everything you could think of, personnel issues, staffing issues, we put together all the calendars, so figuring out what the floor is going to look like. That's what I'm involved doing, and then of course helping other members with their bills so that they know where things go. Mm -hmm. So this is a transition year. Obviously, it's the last year of this administration. Uh, the big project for us in this session is what the Constitution says it is. It's to pass a budget, and we've got good news on that front. We're going to have a bipartisan budget, and yesterday there's lots of money now all of a sudden. I mean, we're on this oil and gas roller coaster, mm -hmm. and after going right off the cliff, now we're going straight up it. And so that means that we can begin to fill all those pockets of money that we pulled to balance things during the last couple of years. Yeah, because we were in trouble last year. Oh, we walked in the door with a $69 million shortfall mm -hmm. in the immediate year and had to pass a package in the first two weeks. So my first two weeks on the job, trying to put that together. And then, you know, as you know, it was an epic kind of battle over budgets and vetoes and the governor vetoing the whole legislative branch and higher education and mm -hmm. community college getting completely eliminated. So. We've been to court and back, and I'm looking forward to a whole different approach. And I just think, come, this is a very important election, and people need to participate. And next year will be night and day different. When are you going to run for governor? <laughs> so I, you know, I never. I'm different than lots of politicians because I, I, I still think of myself as husband, dad, business owner, mm -hmm. and citizen legislator, and I never ran with any kind of political plan. And so I actually, the thing that gets me the most excited is the policy stuff. And so the politics part of it, which I deal with in this position, uh, are something that is not as fun for me as the, as the policy. So. I, you know, this is a brand new, new deal for me, and it's and it's amazing, you know, to be in a position where with the speaker. You know, yesterday we were meeting with the governor and mm -hmm. trying to figure it out here, and it's a, it's a big job right here. So I'm I'm happy right where I am. So we'll we'll see what happens with a, with our governor's race this time around. Do you have any uh, predictions? 
Boy, I, you know, I don't. I mean, I think that what, what I will say, here is a prediction. I think for an off-year election cycle, we're going to have a big turnout. Uh, actually, it's interesting, my, my wife Carol is running for city council here in mm -hmm. Santa Fe, and just seeing her at forums and seeing how engaged people are, I think people have finally realized that the way you address the frustration is not to just scream at the television, it's to get involved. Mm -hmm. I've never seen people as excited as they are about politics, ever. That's exactly right. One way or the other, you know. So, and that's a great thing. That is a great thing because people need to engage. I mean, this is where it happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm just hopeful we have a big, big turnout. And then obviously I want a Democratic governor. You know, we've got four different candidates, one of whom is one of my law school classmates and a friend for almost 30 years, Senator Cervantes, one of our colleagues yes. here. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the day, but I just hope, as uh, Senator Morales said in response to the governor's state of the state, it's kind of a new day okay. at the other end of the tunnel. One last question has nothing to do with this year's legislature. Sure. But are you familiar with the National Firearms Act of 1934? Tell me what it is. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. Good, I bet you will. <laughs> you know, back in the 30s, they had a lot of mafioso, they had the gangsters, there was a lot of people killed back in that time. So they came up with this uh, a practical uh, thing for gun, gun ownership. It was in the Constitution. Not many people even know about it. Uh, they had registration background checks, uh, law-mandated registration of guns, sawed-off shotguns, silencers, hand grenades, other uh, weapons of mass destruction. Um, they had to pass FBI background checks. They paid a $200 tax when they bought, got a gun. Uh, they had mug shots, fingerprints, serial numbers, and uh, it had, had to be entered into a national base. What's wrong with that? Doesn't seem like there's much wrong with it at all. So what happened to it? It's still in effect. Well, and why isn't it being enforced? I have no idea. So when you sit down with our good members of the federal delegation, because it's a, it's a, I assume it's a, it's a... National Fire... Yeah, so fire it's a Arms federal Act legislation. 19th? Yes. It's one to look into. So, you know, again, I, I do think that this gun safety issue is so important. And because we haven't had any action on the federal level, we saw a number of bills last year. Uh, actually, one that was really important passed, Senator Cervantes carried, mm -hmm. dealing with domestic violence and orders of protection, and the governor vetoed it. Which, again, I was very surprised by, given that she was a prosecutor who prosecuted right. domestic violence cases. So, this is you know, one of those areas that I think we need to be proactive. And I, I'm there. Uh, you know, it's, it's challenging with, you know, my, the whole caucus is not there in my caucus. And so, again, this is an education, but to the extent that there's laws on the books that aren't getting enforced, you need to figure out what's going on. Well, I'm not against guns. Sure. Everybody I know sure. has got a gun, but I am for for uh, sensible legislation. Well, I'm, I'm a member of the Sportsman's Caucus. Even though I'm not a gun person, I like to, to fish and have done that forever. Mm -hmm. And so again, you're absolutely right. It, this isn't an issue of taking away someone's guns. It's passing reasonable, responsible uh, regulations to address public safety. Yeah. And so, you know, we'll, we'll keep having that discussion and keep trying to move the needle. I'm gonna cut you off now. Fair enough. Senator, thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. Thank on. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Santa Fe.